Hello, this is Ray Martin from ACG, and welcome to another edition of The Hot Seat. Joining me today from Siena is Joe Marcella, who's Vice President, Product Line Management for the Routing and Switching Portfolio. Joe, thanks for joining The Hot Seat. Thanks, Ray. It's great, great to be here. And is this your first time, I think, right? It is my first time, yeah. Awesome. Well, as you know, in the hot seat, we like to get started uh, right away. And one of the things that we see, Joe, going on in the market is that in 2020, you know, a lot of different things happened that made us think differently about the behavior of customers, the traffic flow. But besides the uh, service providers continue to address their demand for higher bandwidth services, are there any other important trends that network operators should be aware of going forward that you're seeing that's worth sharing with our audience? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of trends I'd, I'd say we could probably talk about. Um, you know, more generically, I'd say you know, the big trend toward network convergence and IP optical convergence are, are really driving a lot of the conversations. Um, if you want to get a little bit more specific uh, on the mobility side, you know, with the, with the investment going on in 5G, we're seeing trends towards CRAN architectures, trends towards virtualization. On the enterprise side, uh, I don't know if you want to call SD-WAN a trend anymore, but Definitely the discussions around the evolution of SD-WAN into things like SASE is, is a big big topic of conversation these days. If you uh, combine mobility and, and enterprise, you know, a lot of conversations out there about, you know, can we use 5G technologies as a Wi-Fi alternative for, for enterprise-based networks? Um, on the residential side, as we've all kind of moved to this work from home or work remote environment, um, we're seeing governments around the world pledging billions of dollars in investment into, into broadband access technology. So things like 10G XGS PON are, are getting a lot of uh, traction these days. And, and along with that, um, ideas about how to do more virtualization in that space to scale. But I think sort of the key trend though, underpinning all of those things we just talked about is really you know, IP densification and, and, and IP connectivity. And, and that's why this topic is so important to us and a, and a key part of our strategy. Yeah, no, this is great. And you touched on a few things because you're right. SD-WAN, it's been around for some time, but we still see some changes on our end where there's the next phase of, of having what I call onboarding a VNF and increasing your TAM and, and targeted margin from that area. But one of the things that I want to add on to the next part, uh, Joe, is related to, you know, if we look traditionally at IP networking uh, vendors, right? Uh, you know, the whole issue is about increasing demand for, you know, addressing demand based on scaling routers, right? And and that's always been the demand, you know, you've, we've had this constant traditional ongoing cycle in that area. Why is it not another traditional router cycle upgrade that you're seeing from your end there? Yeah, I mean, capacity is not going away. We all like, we all like right. capacity, of course, and we'll continue to need uh, higher scale routers to deal with that capacity. But when you look at all those things that we just talked about on the trend side, you know, as we talked about, there's a lot more IP connectivity requirements and, and, and IP endpoints coming out there. In fact, if you go back to one of the drivers for us um, moving into this space years ago, it was really around 5G. And I sort of call it the 5G inflection point, you know, the idea that new spectrum was coming to market. In many cases, that spectrum was even less efficient than existing spectrum. So that was going to drive a whole bunch of new radio requirements across the network. More radios mean more connections, more connections mean more IP endpoints. And, and if we're not careful, then ultimately we end up with more complexity and we, we can't, we can't um, scale the network in the way we want to, you know, adding power, space, OPEX, you know, as these IP endpoints scale. So that was, that was really, you know, sort of our aha moment. And, and you know, we've got to, we've got to look at doing things differently on the IP side as, as, as we go forward. And, and that kind of drove us to this idea of, um, of an adaptive IP solution. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because we've done some research on it, and and this whole concept that you're you're proposing about enhancing your delivery of of standard IP, I think is good because IP has been around for some while, right? But I think it's a different way that you're looking at it, which is kind of interesting. And we've done some work on that area. But from your point of view, could you talk a little bit deeper on on how adaptive IP addresses some of these changes in the market and challenges? Yeah, sure. I mean. Um, I think when we started looking at going into to the IP space, you know, around five years ago now, um, one of the first things we wanted to do was really listen. You know, we had been in the, the Ethernet, the carrier Ethernet business, 12, 15 years at that point. Um, but we wanted to understand from our customers and future customers what their requirements were for not only today, but, but in the future. And, you know, the, there were sort of three trends that came back from those conversations. The one was around openness. 
and you know, by association, I would say interoperability. Uh, that was a big trend. The other one was around automation. We got to get better at, at automating these networks if they're going to scale. And then the third one was about um, streamlining. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing out there today. And you know, can we get a more streamlined architecture going forward? And those those sort of three things sort of bubbled to the top and became sort of the the key principles that, that we wanted to define a solution around. And then you know, it was then well, what are, what is the solution going to look like, right? And you know. I, I, I almost cringe sometimes to say this, but we wanted it to be much more about protocols Okay. because um, protocols, I mean, protocols are critically important and you don't have a solution without the protocols, right. but at the same time, you know, we recognized if we were going to differentiate, if we were going to differentiate and we were going to create value, we needed to, to go beyond just, just the protocol there and, and offer something more than that. And, and that's really kind of led us to kind of three, I would say, com components of the solution. One is and we call it programmable infrastructure. You could call it a network. It's a fancier name, but within that, um, you know, we wanted to start from a next-gen um, containerized OS that was disaggregated that can run in lots of different uh, environments. Um, along with that, we wanted that OS to to support um, next-generation open APIs. We wanted it all to be Yang based, so we didn't have different uh, interfaces uh, for different protocols, but everything was Yang centric. So. The, mm -hmm. the, the attributes and capabilities were the same regardless of the protocol coming into it. Um, we wanted that solution to run on a, on a uh, I would say, a, uh, a set of purpose-built platforms, right? There's a lot of generic platforms out there, but we, we went through a set of applications earlier. Those applications sometimes have unique requirements. So we wanted to, if we were going to invest in hardware, we wanted that hardware to support those applications. And then finally, in that space, you know, we wanted to design the solution from the start even though it was probably a few years away when we started to support IP optical convergence. And I, I want to stress here, it's much more than just about putting a, a plug in a router. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a relatively easy thing to do, but you know, you have to design that router to support the plug number one, but two, there's photonics that have to go along with that. There's software that has to go in that, in that solution. There's software that has to go out of the network to make that all work. So all those things together sort of became the core of the programmable infrastructure. And then the second piece, you know, talking about software is, you know, once you have this programmable infrastructure, I want to do something with it. And mm -hmm. you know, obviously we talked about automation earlier, that, that becomes a, a key driver. You know, how do we automate that infrastructure? You know, SDN controllers are, 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 are becoming the norm, orchestrators are becoming the norm. How do you leverage those to create an automated solution? And I'd say that the most critical thing to get over at the time was, you know, we had to design this to be a multi-vendor solution from the start. Mm -hmm. We're coming into a new space. There's established vendors. You have to have a multi-vendor solution, and I'd, I'd say, you know, either accidentally or on purpose, we actually started our automation journey with third parties because we didn't we didn't have a solution at the time. So that, you know, over the years has brought a unique mindset, I think, to our automation journey, and mm -hmm. that it started from the beginning on the multi-vendor platforms before it even supported our own platform. So I think that was a, a unique a unique set of capabilities. And then the final piece, you know, once you have the automation. And the programmable infrastructure, and we felt it was important to then add some intelligence <laughs> to it. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great to automate something, but if you don't know what you're automating, uh, it doesn't doesn't buy you a lot. So, you know, with with technologies like streaming telemetry, um, with the ability now to to peer into the control plane of the IP layer, we can leverage that data um, through some of the investments that we've been making around um, analytics to make real time decisions that are that are driven by policies that the operator sets. And then feedback back into the automation layer and into the network. So think about this, you know, if I were to summarize it as a as a closed loop policy driven mm -hmm. IP multi-vendor network. That that's really really the goal. Yeah, no, I mean I, I noticed Joe and talking to a lot of service providers, because for many years I've been talking about simplification of the network. And and with the pandemic that happened last year, there were many that says, Hey Ray, you've been talking about segment routing forever, right? Mm -hmm. I really wish we had it, right? You've been talking about automation, simplification, removing silos of automation, right? So I think your your timing, I think it's important from that area. And, and on our team, we have uh, our CTO, Dr. Peter Federoff, who does a lot of the, the business cases and studies like that. He actually did a study where he compare, right, uh, some of the expense, at least from a TCO perspective of, of the evolving IP network to support 5G services. He compare present mode of operation, which we call the legacy approach versus your, your adaptive IP. And it was interesting to see some of the findings. It was very uh, compelling since, you know, you had to avoid any direct 
comparison between router cost and, and different areas of, of present motor operation legacy to this adaptive IP solution you're bringing in. Are you, are you able to, to talk a little bit further about some of those uh, savings that uh, that study found? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was a it was a great it was a great paper, by the way. I mean, um, you know, I maybe it's a bit obvious to say that network cost comes from from capex and opex, right? So, okay. If I if I start on the capex side and, and try to abstract away the router cost as as you as you suggested, you know, I, you could sort of summarize it as is doing more with less, right? On the less right, side, right. You want to get more optimization out of the network. I think I, I mentioned network convergence and IP optical convergence. A lot of that architectural shift is about trying to reduce the components in the network and reduce the ultimate capex. On the on the less side of things, it's it's how do you leverage that analytics and intelligence that we just spoke about to better optimize um, the capacity and, and the services in the network. So that capex is kind of a do more with less, more optimization, mm -hmm. less hardware, and, and and you need that 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 sort of environment to be able to do that. On the opex side, it's always a little bit trickier, as, as you're probably aware, to yes. to not only predict, but also to measure, right? So you, it's, a, it's a little bit harder to do, but at the same time, a lot of the premise around automation and, and, and intelligence is orientated towards a reduction in OPEX, right? If we're gonna scale this network, we gotta get more efficient efficient on OPEX. So you know, I, I think it's really kind of the, the combination of the two that, that, that gets you those, those, those benefits that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point from that area is always a challenge figuring out FTEs associated with a certain operational tasks, but I think the good thing with that is we've we've set a template and a foundation, a methodology that any service providers could change those numbers and plug in their own to, to see what it comes out to. Uh, now, Joe, maybe if you don't mind, I'll ask one more question that we can close with is, sure. yeah, if, if we look at this study, right, it was, it was more motivated from a TCO perspective and cost reduction, which is what we talk about, but I, I meet with a lot of board level uh, executive of these service providers and like, Ray, this is excellent. This is great. You're helping me save money in some of my architectural delivery and creating this platform to enable me to develop new services quicker and potentially increase TAM, right? Uh, so a lot of the discussions with these execs are changing to say, you know, what are the new revenue generating opportunities? What are the new TAM help me increase that so I can improve, you know, my customer balance and improve the top line uh, revenue. So, so on top of cost, they want to know about new revenue. Do you have yep. anything you could touch on that? The trifecta, right? Um, yeah, the trifecta. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, at a, at a, at a high level, I mean, we're all trying to do, um, we're all trying to make money here, right? So yeah. how do we help drive revenue through this? I think it comes through a, a couple of things. One is we're in a highly competitive, highly dynamic world, both from a vendor perspective, but also from a service provider perspective. So how do we, how do we go faster, right? You know, yeah. Can we leverage that open, automated, streamlined environment that we just talked about to, to move faster from a service delivery perspective than the competition? And the other ones around you know, customer experience. You know, can we create a better customer experience um, than the competition. And I think that sort of tag team of moving faster with a greater customer experience is what we try to do as a company internally, but also, also what, we, what, we, what we try to do um, uh, from an adaptive IP perspective to offer our customers the ability to grow their revenue. There's lots of other things you can talk about, you know, from a, from a, uh, uh, a, a dynamic perspective, all those dynamics we talked about early on offer, offer new op opportunities to grow in terms of um, um, service offering, but I think when it gets down to it, it's, it's moving faster with a higher quality of experience. Right, yeah, and you're addressing the whole margin thing associated with that at, at a higher profitability point of view. Absolutely. Well, Joe, you're, you're officially off the hot seat. Wasn't too oh, bad, great. was it? No, it wasn't too bad at all. Awesome, well, with Joe, I'm Ray Moda. Thanks for joining this edition of the Hot Seat.